Welcome back, guys. We're excited to continue in our series on the Gospel according to Luke. Now, last week, we took a break from this series to talk about the Great Commission that you find in the book of Matthew. And Logan Counts did a good job of covering that good news there in Matthew. So today, we're getting back to the Gospel according to Luke. But before we do, we have some other good news. This week, we finally get to meet in person together on Sunday, May 31st, for our Sunday morning service. Uh, the other good news is that this Next Wednesday, on June 3rd, we're going to start meeting every other week for our men's midweek Bible study. I hope you'll be able to join us, but for those of you who cannot, we will still be putting online content out there so that you'll be able to stay engaged and be challenged still. I hope to see you guys next week as, uh, as we can start in a new series, but this week we'll be finishing our series on the Gospel according to Luke. We're going to move on to a bit of the story where Jesus ascends. And this story begins in Luke 24, 50, but we'll actually be talking about the account that we find in Acts. Now remember that Luke and Acts were written as two parts, a continuation of the, of the account that Luke saw and found out from people and sources in the first century. In these two books alone, Luke wrote more words than any other New, Te New Testament author. Uh, Paul may have written two-thirds of the books in the New Testament, but Luke wrote more words and more sheer content than anybody else in history for the New Testament. So Jesus, in the book of Luke, kind of went through the ringer. He, he has emerged victorious, though, which is great news for us. So throughout his life, Jesus had uh, a lot of oppression and a lot of persecution towards him, and he had a lot of issues that he had to overcome. And it started out very early on with oppressive Roman rulers. If you look in the account of Jesus' birth in the book of Matthew, you find out that babies his age were, were slaughtered. So his family had to run to Egypt to get away from it. Uh, he, he was a carpenter. His father was a carpenter. He was a carpenter. And if you think about carpentry now, it's a very labor-intensive job. But imagine in the first century in Judea. Imagine how difficult it would be then. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit to be tempted by the devil. And he was there for 40 days without food or water. Throughout his ministry, he dealt with, uh, with demons and sick people and hard-headed disciples and self-righteous religious leaders who were out to kill him. And all of that was before he was betrayed, before he was beaten and he was mocked and he was crucified by the Romans. And all of it led to this point where we see Jesus ascend. He's already been resurrected, and after his perfect sacrifice and after the completion of his earthly ministry, he ascends to the throne of God, and he sits at the right hand of the Father in his rightful place. And he becomes an intercessor for us in heaven. But we're going to start here in Acts chapter 1, verse 1. It says this, I wrote the former account, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven, after he had given orders by the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. To the same apostles also, after his suffering, he presented himself alive with many convincing proofs. You should believe it. It's convincing. He, he was seen by them over a 40-day period, and he spoke about matters concerning the kingdom of God. He was telling them about the kingdom of God. While he was with them, he declared, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for what my father promised, which you heard about from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had gathered together, they began to ask him, Lord, is this the time when you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? And that's actually been an undercurrent, a theme throughout the book of Luke, is that the people here don't expect Jesus to just be a religious or spiritual leader. They want him to be a military leader, too. They want him to lead the Jews to victory over the Romans, because God's Messiah is supposed to come and free the Jews. He's supposed to come and overthrow the Romans. He's not supposed to just leave. His reply is not what they're looking for. Verse 7 says this, He told them you are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the farthest parts of the earth. 
after he had said this, while they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud hid him from their sight. As they were still staring into the sky while he was going, suddenly two men in white clothing stood near them. And these two men may very well be the same men that were at the tomb of Jesus. They were there, ready to tell Mary and Martha that Jesus was alive, that he was resurrected. And these two men said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking up into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come back in the same way you saw him go into heaven. So I'd like to emphasize a couple verses today in the hope that we will each be challenged. And first we're going to look at verses 4 and 5. It says, while he was there with them, he declared, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait there for what my father promised, which you heard about from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. We see that the Father has promised something, and that something is called the Holy Spirit. He's promised it to Jesus' disciples. And Jesus reminds them that this is not the first time they've heard about this Holy Spirit. That Jesus went so far as to say that it's better for them that he leaves and the Holy Spirit comes. That it's better for the Holy Spirit to be here than for Jesus to be present in the flesh. And that's the, that same thing is true for us today, that it's better for the Holy Spirit to be here, to be baptized into him, than for Jesus to be present in the flesh. According to Jesus, the disciples will be baptized, which means submerged or immersed by the Holy Spirit very soon. That they will be flooded over with it. And up to this point, no human has had the Holy Spirit come on them and stay on them except for Jesus. Remember that John was told that he would see a sign that the one who the dove of the Holy Spirit descends upon and stays upon is his chosen one. And that happened to Jesus. In the Old Testament, there were craftsmen and there were singers and prophets Samson and King David and King Saul, they all had the Holy Spirit come upon them, but he didn't stay. Jesus is the only one that he stayed on permanently. Now, these disciples here in the book of Acts are given the promise that the Holy Spirit will be their constantly present advocate. But what does that do for them? What does that do for us now if we're baptized in the Holy Spirit? And that's what verses 7 and 8 tell us. It says, it told, he told them, Jesus told them, you are not permitted to know the times or periods that the Father has set, before his own, has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, you will receive power. And what else will you do? Will you, do? you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right here, and in all Judea and Samaria, the, the surrounding areas, and to the farthest parts of the earth. You'll get to go. And I'd like to draw on a famous list found in Galatians to inform what this may look like for us when the Holy Spirit empowers someone. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, we see, we see that Paul says, But I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. So they're being led by the Spirit. The Spirit is constantly with them. These people that he's talking about, Christians. For the flesh has desires that are opposed to the Spirit. And the Spirit has desires that are opposed to the flesh. For these are in opposition to each other, so that you cannot do what you want. And verse 19 says, Now the works of the flesh are obvious. This is the first list that you find in Galatians. It says sexual immorality, impurity, depravity, idolatry, sorcery, Hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish rivalries, dissensions, factions, envying, murder, drunkenness, carousing, and similar things. I am warning you as I had warned you before, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And here's the list that I'd like to draw on for, for today. It says in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit Things that the Spirit will bring about in you is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. 
So we see here these fruits of the Spirit. And when I read this while studying for this video, I was reminded of a story about the man who wrote the, the song Amazing Grace. His name is John Newton. And as some of you may know, this, uh, this songwriter who wrote the, one of the most famous hymns of the last 200 years, an incredible hymn that really speaks to the grace of God and how wonderful it is. This songwriter was by every account an extremely sinful man. Early in his adult life, he was a, a slave trader. Uh, the story goes that by the age of 11, he had already started drinking and that he was prone to drunkenness and fits of anger. He attempted to desert his post in the British Navy. He was a deserter. And he engaged in just about every sin that you find in that list that Paul gives in Galatians. So it's an incredible story because God pulled Newton to himself through what could be described as miraculous means. John's ship was set upon by an incredibly terrible storm, but he was kept from harm. And he ended up giving his life to God and becoming a minister. He was baptized in, and empowered by the Holy Spirit, and he left his old habits and his profession as a slave trader behind. He wasn't, he wasn't prone to drunkenness anymore, but it didn't happen quickly. It was over a, a long time that he transitioned from indulging those things that you find in that first list to being able to showcase those virtuous fruits of the Spirit that you find in Galatians chapter 5. His story came to mind not only because of the drastic change in his life, but because of what we find next in Acts chapter 1. Jesus says in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. We've already seen that. And he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the farthest parts of the earth. Jesus makes it clear that the reason he sets his disciples apart from the rest of the world is to be witnesses to God's amazing grace. We are to receive power from the Holy Spirit to be able to tell the whole world of the good news. Now John Newton's testimony does just that. The song that he wrote, Amazing Grace, does that. Apparently it's been on over 11,000 albums. That means it's been heard dozens of thousands of thousands of times. And there's no doubt in my mind that people having heard that song, some people having heard that song, would have began to explore who Jesus is and began a relationship with him. That that was one of the, the spurs that caused them to explore a relationship with Jesus. Now, we don't need to write the next Amazing Grace, the next world's greatest hymn, to spur people to explore the truth of the gospel. What we need to do is much simpler, although it may be difficult. Our actions don't need to be as grand as a song, but we can exhibit the power of the Holy Spirit. We can exhibit the power of the Holy Spirit with those fruits that you find in Galatians chapter 5 by showcasing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Those things are not natural to us, but the Holy Spirit can empower us to do those things. And these qualities are supposed to be a constant for us. They're supposed to be a constant for us toward non-Christians and Christians alike. That there isn't supposed to be any sort of favoritism that we act good in front of outsiders, but that we show these things to outsiders and insiders alike. My last, my last comment here is that we simply cannot do this alone. The story of the Bible and the story of mankind makes it clear that it's not good for man to be alone. It's very early on that we find that before, before there are even two humans in existence, God says that. And we know that whenever we were alone, we get into trouble. People get into trouble whenever they go it alone. They need backup. So if we expect to exhibit those fruits of the Spirit, we must be in contact, regular contact, with people around us who challenge us to engage in a deep relationship with God. 
and we must be in community with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we just end up powerless. It says here in Acts that the Holy Spirit comes upon us to give us power. Power to be able to do the good work of God, to spread the gospel to the whole world. But we end up powerless to share the good news of the gospel. We end up powerless to share our testimony of what God has done and of his grace. And we end up powerless without regular community. Without regular community with people, without regular community with Holy Spirit, we are left powerless. But the good news is that because of Jesus' death, because he has ascended and, he is, and the Father has now sent the Holy Spirit to empower us, things are better for us now than whenever Jesus was present on the earth. That the Holy Spirit is going to be a constant advocate for us. And that all we need to do is accept Christ so that we can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and filled with him so that we can begin to live out this powerful life, this life that sets us apart in quality from, from other people, that we have something qualitatively different about us, that we exhibit these fruits of the Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do these things for the glory of God. I hope that this week we will take this opportunity to explore what that really means, to explore what it looks like for the Holy Spirit to empower us, and to explore what it looks like to continue in a deep, deep relationship with God, to explore a relationship and community with the Holy Spirit, to explore what it looks like to challenge others around us to do the same. I hope that this week we'll be able to engage in conversations with other men who need this sort of challenge in their lives. Thank you for listening.